Roger's work originally is in German um, 19th century realism novel. Um, he wrote a book on that. He wrote a book on Heinrich Heine, the great philosopher and satirist and uh, so-called formats of the pre-revolutionary times. But then he also became a scholar of film studies. He was the director of film studies for quite a while here. And uh, a couple of books, edited books there on Wim Wenders. But then his last book, Post Cinematic Vision. And there's been a shift there where Roger looks more and more, um, I think it's more and more influenced by cognitive science, by uh, neuro, uh, neuroscience, cognitive theories, um, evolutionary theory. Biosemiotics, I would say, is for both of us a place where things could hear because we see great transitions from there, from that evolutionary biological base to the humanities and to media studies. Roger's second, you know, biosemiotics, evolutionary theory, cognitive studies meets media theory, media history. And uh, his argument was really in the book was around the cinema, the importance, the neurological importance of cinema for us today. And I think he's now looking at language and its special status from that dual perspective. All right, take it away, Roger. <laughs> Thanks, Carson. Very relevant, uh, uh, good uh, introduction. Uh, before I start, the second part of the talk uh, does bring in biosemiotics. And I'm just curious, how many of you are familiar at all with biosemiotics? Anybody? Okay, I, I'm going to give uh, some of the basic concepts, so it's not really necessary. But I, didn't, I didn't expect a lot of familiarity. Uh, so what is special about language? Uh, is language a part of the biological system? Uh, of the human or a technological uh, addition. The first part of the talk, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to propose with it, we can consider it as both. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to bring those two sides together and to try to give an answer to uh, the question, what is special about uh, language? Uh, Carson mentioned the book. This is very self-promoting, I know, but the other reason to uh, put this up here is this is the last image you will see. I apologize. <laughs> I know even as academics, uh, we are used to uh, PowerPoint presentations that have images throughout. I really wanted to put images in there. They would have been so gratuitous that it would have been laughable. So uh, this one, at least as Carson said in the introduction, uh, plays a role because the first part of the talk, which deals with the co-evolution of the human and the technology, stems from the, the theory uh, in my book, which was applied to cinema. Uh, and media uh, contemporary media theory does a lot of this uh, work with the co-evolution uh, idea. And I'm gonna give an int uh, introduction uh, to that. Uh, there had not been, it has still had not been much work done with respect to cinema. A lot with digital media. How does digital media change us uh, as human beings in, in neurological and physical and evolutionary ways? But cinema was considered to be kind of whole hum in, in that regard, that we that we take in cinema purely cognitively. I argue against that, and as Carson said in the introduction, uh, may, uh, try to describe how uh, cinema has changed us as humans uh, biologically. I think that might be at least neurologically uh, and uh, how we have co-evolved with it. So that's the, the book. Now, this talk was originally scheduled uh, for two years ago, spring of 2020. Uh, at that time, it was gonna be based on the book. There would have been a lot of pics, maybe even a clip, some great films, cool films like The Matrix, Dark City, 13th Floor films that I discuss in the, the last section of the book, but you can blame this on the pandemic, two years lapsed, and then I took the basic theory here and I began doing research into language and how it would apply to language. And so I might defend that there are no images, I guess I can say the talk is about language, but uh, I apologize for that. Now it's just text. Two just, pre I'm just, these are preliminary perspectives I'm gonna throw out there just to kind of thought before delving into the argument. Um, distinguishing between speech and written language, Andy Clark, Andy Clark is a philosopher, actually was at Washington University uh, before then, uh, maybe around 2000 or so, went to Edinburgh in, uh, in uh, Scotland. 
uh, and he's one of the uh, uh, most prominent uh, philosophers who deal with the question of co-evolution technology. And he describes our use of speech as both biologically proper to the human agent as the use of webs is the spider. Whereas written text straddle the intuitive divide between the web, biologically proper, and the crane, an artifact, not the apple, but the machine, the crane. Okay. Uh, and the second, uh, these are again just little thought provoking things I wanted to put out there. The second is a quote from the Ministry for the Future uh, by Kim Stanley Robinson. Anybody here read Kim Stanley Robinson? Uh, highly recommend. Recommendable. Uh, and this is most recent of 2020. Uh, within one short chapter, there's a, a debate. Uh, two people debated. We don't know who they are. Uh, and point we are Homo Faber, band the maker, and our tools are the only thing that allow us to cope with the world. We even co evolved with our tools. First, stones were picked up and sharpened, then, fires started on purpose, and then tools made us human. The counterpoint, the second person, you end up saying design is technology, law is technology, language is technology, even thinking is technology. And put it right out there, I'm with counterpoint uh, in this debate. And I would raise the question here, just throw this out. Thinking is technology, what about space? And what about time? What extent are they also technologies? <laughs> okay, first part of the talk then on co evolution of technology and the human, uh, based on media theory from the book. Uh, the concept of prosthetic extension uh, that concept goes back to Marshall McLuhan. Everybody here familiar with Marshall McLuhan? Maybe not. Uh, if you've gone to college today when he wrote back in the 60s, you would know uh, Marshall McLuhan. He was a really uh, a hot item, uh, but he was really the first to throw out this, this concept that technology is an extension of the human into the external world. He calls it a prosthetic extension because it helps us cope, uh, cope with the world. And it's a prosthetic extension of the human biological system, which works its effects back onto the body and changes our nervous system. This is the idea of the coevolution, the very basic idea. And the, we have the quote here, physiologically man in the normal use of technology or his variously extended body is perpetually modified by it and in turn finds ever new ways of modifying his technology. That's the basic uh, statement of the co-evolution. Now, concept related to that, very closely related, is this concept of technogenesis. Uh, this stems from uh, contemporary media theory, that term. It's not really much different from what was just stated about the, co the, the basic idea of uh, prosthetic extension in the, in the co-evolution, but it's a very radical statement of that. Uh, the capacity to archive and retrieve representations of key technological processes in the external world propelled hominid out of the slow plotting advance of biological evolution and into an ever accelerating cycle of bodily changes that occur in response to the alterations it makes in the world, okay? Uh, and that archiving and retrieving of represent, representations, of course, the question is, what is the first medium? And according to this concept of techno, uh, technogenesis, the first medium is actually the first tool, at least the first tool that was reproduced. And in what sense is it a medium? It archived in that tool itself are the steps required to make the tool, okay? Not uh, explicitly archived, but they are in the tool. The repetition of making the tool is there for the maker, the first makers of tool is, it, it really uh, almost requires that tool to be there, that first uh, medium. Uh, and then again, this is basically restating this basic concept of technogenesis or, or coevolution of human. Uh, early tools were not just primitive prosthetic devices that supported and extended already existing systems of biomechanics. 
the new neural networks they required were the scaffolding for expanded me uh, mechanical and cognitive brain function. Uh, and this, this concept scaffolding will come up again and again uh, in, in the talk. Uh, but of course, there were some basic mechanical networks there that enabled humans to use the tools. But as soon as they, this co-evolution idea, as soon as the tools were used, that created the new neural networks and new systems uh, for uh, the advanced tools. Uh, co-evolution of tool production in the human organism, exaptation. The co-evolution of the human with the technologically altered cultural environment creates in each successive phase, not only new systems, but also a distinct techno-biological pattern of adaptation. As the co-evolution process occurs, the pattern becomes more complex of the way that process occurs, okay? Uh, and that's, this is uh, why we have that extreme acceleration, slow at first, and of course now ever faster and faster, acceleration in that process of the uh, technological advance and the change uh, in humans. Through the engagement with new tech technologies, each generation attains a new mantle of neural circuitry that extends the existing systems. In order to engage with the new tools, you think about digital media, is, is, that's why it comes in media theory so, so much, it requires a, a real revamping of our neural networks for us to engage. We don't do it as well as, or I said we, some of you are younger, but the, my generation doesn't deal with it as well as the new generation, obviously, because the new generation learned it as kids as they're growing up uh, and develop neural circuits that are, I don't develop as quickly, or any of us develop as, as, we, get, as we get older. Now, how is that neural circuitry passed down? Now, there's no evidence that the plasticity in our neural, neural networks the, the new uh, neural systems that are developed uh, as we engage with the world are in fact inherited, but they don't have to be inherited biologically because each new generation will engage the technology that has been invented, will develop those neural networks through that engagement with the technology, okay? Uh, and then will produce even newer technology which the next generation, the young generation will pick up and so forth. And they each, just as in each technology, as technology itself advances, uh, it, it all builds upon the previous generations of technology, right? It, it's, it's a matter of growing. The same thing is happening biologically uh, in the body as well. Now you can imagine well, what happened if, uh, if suddenly culture, uh, advanced technological culture ended, uh, then we wouldn't, but will we still have that evolutionary process going on? Um, interesting question. One of the films I teach in my post-humanism uh, cinema course is uh, Planet of the Apes, which I don't know, the original Planet of the Apes, which in fact imagines exactly that scenario, that uh, everything is thrown back to a pre-technologically advanced world. And so then that raises an interesting kind of sci-fi sci question, maybe not. We may end up there someday, but the question, well, where would we be if we don't have the technology to sustain that kind of uh, evolutionary process? Okay, the co-evolution of tool and mental, uh, tool production and mental imaging. The first prerequisite for language is an advanced central nervous system that is capable of integrating, storing, interpreting and acting on the manifold signals detected by its various receptor neurons, any organism, which is including humans, we detect these uh, signals, but you need a central nervous system to turn them into what Antonio Damasio calls mappings or internal representations. Uh, and then the ability to uh, integrate them to wrecking, eventually humans to recognize them uh, and, to, and to act on uh, act on. And so this is a prerequisite uh, for language, language as, as we'll see going, uh, going forward. Uh, uh, 
probably skip over that next point. Uh, the tool itself served as a medium for the individual who produced it, but for the cultural niche, and this goes back to the idea of the first medium, and the, the first tool of the medium, but for the cultural niche of the group, a means of communicating the production method was essential. Okay, the first person who produced the tool that could reproduce it would need some way of conveying that process to uh, his, his children, someone else in the group, whatever our group, groups interconnect. The, otherwise, that gets that medium doesn't work. Okay. But, okay. Uh, and so it would have to be invented again in each new successive uh, era. Okay, the coevolution of tool production and the emergence of language. And I put under there just some of the, these are some of the disciplines that I've been drawing, that I was drawing on uh, in the article. I'm just putting them up there. To, and this is, of course, the way things are working now contemporarily. There's so much overlap in these, these kinds of areas. Uh, I will, for example, here, if we want two or three maybe such sightings, just to give you a, a kind of a sense of the kind of uh, uh, articles and research that I've been working with. <clears throat> so research into the connection between the motor control system for manual gestures and mirroring systems, mirror neurons, suggest that the mode of communication that maintained the production of stone tools was mimetic gesturing. And this breaks with an earlier view of, uh, that many had of the origin of language, that language uh, originated, for example, in grunts and shouts and, and different sounds were made and originated that one. A newer hypothesis is that it's this interconnection between the manual mode of making tools uh, and then the development of linguistic uh, ability. And here, some of the uh, evidence for this. Uh, neurophysiological and behavioral studies have shown that manual gestures and vocal language share the same control system, a dual hand mouth motor command system, which may be the platform on which a combined manual and vocal communication system is constructed. And that dual system is located in the Broca area, which I'm sure many of you know that the Broca area is essential to language comprehension production to a certain extent as well, but it's, it's, it's essential to language ability. And this suggests that human speech at its origins was closely linked to practice oriented manual imitation. And some in this area even argue uh, more specifically, more particularly, that the teaching of tool use was the way that, that uh, the step was made from the medic gesturing to See in a second called proto speech. And this is the technological hypothesis of language evolution. There's actually a kind of, if you will, a school within the study of language evolution. The evolution is called the te uh, technological hypothesis. Mimetic gesturing sustained the production of stone tools in the older one period. That's roughly, you know, those things vary, of course, but roughly that period without ushering in any major technological advances. So stone tool, the production of stone tools uh, without language to convey, to communicate, remain rather primitive. But narrow. Sure. You, Wilfred, you said before that the actual tool retains in itself yeah. an implicit instruction Man, yeah. I see it's sharp on the edge, it's blunt. On the... How does that jive with what you're saying now that if there's no language accompaniment, now you're saying it needs to be transmitted right. specifically? Well, it goes back to the earlier point. If you don't have language to convey from person to person, that first tool works for the maker of the tool, who has made the tool and then sees in the tool can can kind of retrace uh, the, the steps, the combinatory steps by looking at the but the other cannot until there's some way of communicating. Thanks for the clarification. And I, I welcome questions in here. I, uh, this may be too dense. I don't, I'm not sure exactly, but, uh, and it's hard sometimes when you're in the middle of something to know what's getting across. And what's not. But thank you. Yeah. Can you just, can you just restate the point you made that, like, um, the, 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 the,
but it's folded at the in your words, but it's folded at the language to communicate how it's made. Yeah, because, well, the, the, the tool itself, as I was arguing, is a medium. Yeah. It archives the steps, right? Not explicitly, but it does, because the maker of the tool can look at that tool, and then, you know, we're, we're speculating here, obviously, but can mentally re, uh, rework the steps it was needed, and re need, would have to do that to be able to reproduce the tool, okay? Uh, but... How, how does that person convey that, those steps, to the person who has not made the tool, right? Without some form of language. Mimetic gesturing was the first form of communication about, according to this hypothesis, but would not be sufficient for that kind of, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a thing. Just, just to follow sure. up, wouldn't be sufficient for sufficiently complex technology. Chimpanzees right. have tool traditions without language. Yeah, it may be sufficient for stone tool, right? That, and, you know, the mimetic gesturing, to, but here we have this in the, well, this comes in the next one, I guess, the slide about the, to the lithic, uh, the Chilean period, the, the uh, lithic, uh, you know, with the faster development is then connected with what we're going to see, proto speech, the beginning of a kind of uh, language. Probably what we have here, proto speech. Uh, so the, this theory proto science first the mimetic gesturing you have what developed was a system a code if you will a very fundamental code of proto signs that were used in mimetic gesturing they form the substrate then for the emergence of the earliest forms of speech which are called proto speech and we're going to talk then about the sense why proto speech is not yet like Uh, so the next big advance in tool culture depended on a more robust and more flexible medium. This is the an answer to your question for not only conveying existing techniques, but also for the conception and elaboration of new ones. And thus the steps from stone tools to the Chilean period, the lithic tool industry. Uh, and these required new neural systems to, pro to process the prototype. And they form the substrates for the emergence of early speech. Act. So this is that co-evolutionary process. The mimetic gesturing, the proto signs require a cognitive, basic cognitive advance and form the substrate then for the next step of early speech acts, which are proto-speech. Is this still Arvid's argument about uh, a shooting? Uh, I can't recall okay. which person, which yeah. we're, we're we can at. talk about it later. There's yeah, a, that's an interesting. You may you you may have something to interject there. Really so, yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't recall that yeah. target. Or, he, he's one of the big, uh, as I'm sure Carthy knows, one of the big names in in this this uh, kind of research. Uh, all right. So. This is the argument of the first part, the origin, origins of language in, uh, in speech as a technological innovation. Spoken language served as a new technology, a prosthetic extension of the human senses and the faculties, and we'll come back to that, into an external instrument, which then engenders changes in the body so that it can interact with them. So it changed, but it, the, in the echelon period, the hominin as hominin advances, there has to be neural changes in able to uh, understand the tool making process and to enter things. And, have, and this is very complicated. I'm offering a very simple, obvious uh, um, kind of uh, description here of the process, but the evolution and spread of this new medium led to physiological and neurological changes that were needed to effectively produce and, per and perceive both the sounds and the virtual operations they represented, right? The virtual operations of, of making tools. They included high-speed vocal motor system, an expansion of the auditory repertoire to include the new auditory objects and sequences of speech. The brain had to be able to, to understand this whole new repertoire of, of uh, sounds. So, the third point, that's where obviously extremely complicated. 
question. Yes, yes, without question. My question for you is, and maybe you're getting yeah. it. Do you see this, language as a prosthetic design is this a design that happens quickly evolutionary? No. Or is it very slow language? Very slow. I mean, over, you know, uh, development language over how many millions? Thousands. Thousands. Million, one point two, one point five. I mean, there you throw out a lot of different. No, very slow, very slow process. It speeds up as ever as the coevolution of human technology is a constant process of acceleration. Building. Yeah. You see an incredible change in your idea of record mm. somewhere around 50, 70, 80,000 years ago. Yeah. An amazing change. Yeah. How do we account for that in terms of this? There seems to be something that happened very quickly. We have information that there could have been bottleneck, like you're still yeah. arguing about Africa versus uh, Europe, Asia, but um, how do you Well, I'm going to answer that kind of in a side piece. Uh, yeah. What I'm introdu introducing here uh, is in direct opposition to no uh, Noam Chomsky, as much of the contemporary uh, study of language evolution is. Uh, Noam Chomsky's answer to that would be 150,000 years ago, roughly, a language module developed in the brain and enabled humans to work linguistically. That's his response. It happened. There was biological evolution, and the biological evolution allowed language, and that would have happened. So that that kind of addresses, you know, you know, one perspective on that that uh, burst of advance. Uh, I would put it the other way. It's well, it'll come out when it when it goes from proto speech to language, right? From proto speech to language. That's the big leap forward. Not that that happened quickly, but that uh, that is the gap that sets off hominid from uh, from other primates. Question that novices, no, sorry, no people like to ask when I kind of talk about this. Well, what about you know we can teach apes, right? To a certain extent, we can teach apes language, but it's proto speech. The very very basic proto speech is that all apes can do. All right, they cannot. They cannot use language to represent something that's not there, right? And so that's the, that's the big job. All right. Um, this uh, this phone, phonological loop. Are you familiar with that concept? Somebody, some of you probably are. Uh, Aaron Baddeley, Aaron Baddeley's concept or scheme of working memory. Uh, it's very very well known. It gets circulated a lot, but. If, but it's part. It's all part of those changes that have had to happen both physiologically and cognitively uh, for these advances. Uh, and and that big step forward from proto speech to language is basically the leap from indexical linguistic utterances to abstract symbolic language. Indexical means this is related to that. Which are always working in the present, things that are, that are present. And at what abstract symbolic language is when language can represent things that are not there, past things, future things. The development of new tools requires uh, it requires that kind of ability to, to understand, to represent, and imagine things that are, are not there in the present. Uh, I was going to pause after the first, <laughs> the first part to see if there might be questions for, before continuing, but we've, but you know, I, well, and also people, I don't know if people are going to ask there, but I can't see what they're uh, there. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome on Zoom to ask a question. Yeah. Going, yeah uh, this is I'm a trying. conceptual question. I don't know to say it's inappropriate at this point. I'm just not, I'm, I'm confused about the role of evolutionary theory here. So this process sounds very Lamarckian. The evolutionary process you've got, right? The mutations are independent of the environmental scheme, yeah, yeah. right? Uh, uh, we have examples of genetic assimilation. They're nowhere near as complicated as the ones that you're proposing here. Yeah, uh, it's not Lamarckian. I mean, Lamarck does certain things. It goes past Lamarck. This will come up in the next section. Okay. So I let's let me, let me table that, and then you can Thanks. jump in there. No, I don't. Yeah, that's great. 
Okay, the second part of the, uh, of the talk is language's affiliation with living organisms. The second part is going to argue that language functions uh, in, a, in a way analogous to all living organisms. The way living organisms interact with the world, reproduce, expand, language functions in a similar uh, way. Again, I'm going to start with just a couple of preliminary observations. Uh, this idea derives support from the application of evolutionary theory to languages in the field of language evolution. Um, and increasingly, evolutionary biologists and linguists, together with researchers in neurolinguistics, argue that languages evolve according to natural selection and more recently due to random drift as well. These ideas get kind of radical, I think, for people to, to, to accept. We're going to come back a little bit. In a, uh, a little bit back to that. Terence Deacon states this more radically than anyone. Terence Deacon spoke here four years ago. You say he was the very first yeah. person in the ESS, uh, and his a strong influence on, on uh, my work. Language co-evolves with its host much in the same manner as a parasite or a virus. Yeah. Isn't every organism biological? Every isn't every living uh, the same. Is there a non-biological organism? Why do we why do we talk about living organisms? <laughs> I, I, I mean I, I know I think we do so use I'm struggling yeah. I know yeah. that once I grant yeah. that to you, Roger, oh it's the field opens up a lot. Yeah. But I'm I'm struggling that I, I don't see an organ a social system is not an organism. It has for I would answer it, yeah, I would answer it this way. We usually use organism, the word organism in that sense. But the fact that we do modify by sometimes by saying living organisms shows that we also consider social and cultural uh, phenomena as organisms. And that's going to be my argument about language. Okay. So that, that's a good question because I think it's that point out. And you can go at me at the end. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, biosemiotic, I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and biosemiotics is uh, a theory of, uh, of what life is that says all living or all forms of life, all living uh, uh, organisms from the single cell all the way up to the chain of humankind depend on their ability to read. Semiotics comes from linguistics originally, and it's reading signs. Semiotics is about reading signs. All living organisms read the environment, read signs from the environment they're in and respond to them. Uh, and they read signs both endosemiotically within the organism, right? The organism has to read some change in the organism and, uh, and respond and also exosemiotically to external uh, uh, proponents. Yes, for Hofmeier, the biggest name in the this is a real school biosemiotics, a real school that was a, was a Danish professor, Copenhagen, the leading figure in biosemiotics. Terence Deacon, very close to them, although he didn't really fly under the flag or march under the flag of biosemiotics strictly, certainly very, very close in, in, in their ideas. And again, I go back to Antonio Damasio, uh, not at all, never used the term biosemiotics, but he is, uh, account of the evolution of life really fits in uh, very well. And I'm anticipating the questions here, why biosemiotics? Why have this kind of theory that brings in semiotics to try and describe what living organisms are? And, uh, for, and first, the last piece of, not the last, but another piece of biosemiotics the one that might raise this question the most is they, they the theory of science they work with is uh, Charles uh, Sanders Peirce, uh, who you may or may not be familiar with, uh, logician, philosopher, uh, and his triadic, he had a theory of the triadic relations of science. Iconic, indexical, symbolical. Iconic is simply recognizing something like what maybe proto speech did, iconic. This is that recognition, basic recognition, this is that. Indexical is a relation between two things, but again, would be relationship between two things that, you, that are either 
that are present, let's say that, or at least envisioned as present. And then third is symbolical. This is the key. The symbolical is when you develop a set of a digital code is, is what you do, or a set of symbols, a code that can represent something that's not present. And that's the big step forward. Can you go back to your last slide for sure. a moment? I hate to do this, but I gotta ask a little question. Yeah, that's okay. What's the difference according to this definition from biosemiotics and stimulus response theory? Uh, I mean, I can put stimulus in response. I can put some internal symbols and external symbols. Okay. So now, how is it any different? Definitions are odd things in science, neither true nor false, but hopefully useful. Uh, and I would say this is true in theories as well. Damasio doesn't use biosimilarities. You don't have to use biosimilarities, but can it help? Right? So, stimulus theory, uh, you know. Another way, maybe of describing the same I mean, thing. If we're looking for parsing, I don't need this to explain your previous No, life. no, but but it may help, and it may not help you. I'm not saying it's wrong. Yeah, no. I'm not wrong, so I'm quite familiar with what Bob Simeon. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, and and um, you can I you think can lean on these things as if they explain things that they don't necessarily explain wrong. Well, you 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 may not you you may reject biosemiotics and its approach. Uh, I'm going to try and show the last part of this, that okay, it, sure. how it's helpful for this particular. Can I interject something? Yeah. Like a second? Do it quick as a response. Stimulus response to this thought, right? Biosignatic is not perfect. The idea here is that the organism can indeed read science, if you wish, in a creative, innovative way and adapt its own structure. That's the stimulus response to me seems much more. But that's how I would Yeah, I, I, I was going to say this. This, this is a peripheral <laughs> discussion. Whereas I, I'm going to work with biosemiotics, and I and I'm trying to give you a reason that that I, I think it makes sense to do it for me and and for the study of language. Remember, semiotics works with language. So that if you're trying to understand language, maybe biosemiotics is a theory that that would be useful. But it's not. It's not a matter of truth, right? It's a matter. But this is that's why it's useful. Uh, okay, that's a basic statement of biosemiotics. It challenges the general centric theory, right? Genetic information is only one element in what they call a relational entirety that determines how an organism and a species adapts and evolves. All right, it's a race. It's not this whole idea that genes determine everything, which is something that's coming more and more into challenge, uh, being challenged more. Uh, biosemiotics certainly challenges that. Uh, genes do. I, I kind of skip over this for time reasons. I'll, I'll skip over this. But code duality is a, a, a concept in biosemiotics that we're going to kind of come up again. Code duality is what enables symbolic, en enables language versus proto speech. Code duality means you have a digital code. Language, once it becomes language and not just proto speech, is a digital code. Words, or rather the correct term is lexemes. Lexemes include all words, but also phrases that are a lexematic, is not a root word I'm going to use, <laughs> a lexematic item. Uh, so that's a digital code. It's symbolic, it's abstract, it, re it refers to things that are not present. So the semiotic process involves transcription between the digital code of the biosemiotic here, of the DNA, and the iconic and dexical analog relations detected by its organic composed component. The organism, as it interacts with the environment, uh, picks up on iconic, this is that, oh, there's a relationship here, and indexical relationships, the DNA code uh, constitutes the digital, the DNA constitutes the digital code that works with those uh, stimuli, the, the, those indexical and iconic relations that are picked up by the organism and uh, works towards the fitness, the evolutionary fitness, if you will, of the organism. Some uh, three basic concepts of, of uh, biosymbiotics. Uh, semiotic scaffolding, and I'm, I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, with, 
50 minutes. Uh, was, so we still have some right. final uh, Q&A. So, uh, semiotic scaffolding, scaffolding is simply the way this relational entirety builds up. It's a history, if you will. It's a history and, and a, a building up of the responses in the organism. Semiotic competence, the evolution, according to Bison, the evolutionary fitness of the organism depends almost less on the gene than it does on the semiotic competence, the ability of the organism to read those signs correctly and then interact, always interacting with the gene. This is not to discount genetic inheritance, but it's to put it into a larger context of how uh, of fitness and evolution. And then, according to this, the most important feature of organic evolution was not the creation this is a radical idea, but not the creation of a multiplicity of amazing morpho morphological structures, but the general expansion of semiotic freedom. It's semiotic freedom, the ability to interpret in a new way. Think back to the flexibility uh, in creating new tools, a, the ability to uh, read in a new in a new way is what really leads to kind of uh, uh, the highest form of evolutionary fitness. Uh, I'm gonna go kind of quickly through this. Uh, and this kind of gets to that, well, why biosymbiotic? Well, another kind of description that, it, that it, if you would prefer to work with uh, is, is what's called the ex, uh, extended evolutionary synthesis, a kind of new model of, of uh, describing evolution, uh, and it brings in the Baldwin effect, phenotypic plasticity. Phenotypic plasticity means simply the ability of the individual uh, adult organism to interact, uh, to, to interact with the environment or culture in our case, and to, and to become uh, semiotically fit through that kind of, because of the plasticity, evolutionary inheritance, et cetera. Uh, Dennis Walsh, who plays into this, this is actually an article, it's an article I wrote since over the last couple of years. And I, I do actually cite Dennis Walsh in, in there. He's coming in three Six weeks. Yeah. He's one of the key figures. He's a co-editor of this uh, key anthology, challenging the modern synthesis. Uh, and I just bring this in, extended uh, evolutionary synthesis fits very well with the model that, that I'm suggesting. Semiotic freedom, the concept, and language. Now we'll get to where how this plays into language. Uh, the semiotic freedom that's at work in biological systems also supports language's path in its co evolution with humankind. What's going to become a little bit radical in this idea is seeing language evolving in a way parallel to biological evolution, human biological evolution, but evolving uh, on its own. Terence Deacon is is a real proponent and states this idea more, more radically than anyone else would say. Uh, and the evolution of language works in a manner analogous to that in biology. Words are the digital code, the way that DNA is a digital code. And how does that parallel work? So we have a language, we have a digital code of words with certain meanings, but we evolve, cultural evolution, culture evolves. And language has to evolve with it, right? Uh, because we have new experiences. And just a, some current examples of the way that digital code works uh, and, and evolves along. We come up with new lexemes, words or lexemes. Cancel, just some examples, cancel culture, gender gap, gig economy, you know, there are many, many such examples. Language evolves together with the culture because because language, together with the human, has to understand those new experiences linguistically. Uh, and here we have code duality again, the code duality that is described by biosemiotics in the organism with DNA and uh, the uh, interaction with the environment uh, is working here in language as well. Umwelt is just a German word for environment. Uh, Uck School, I just threw that here. Uck School is a, a key influencer of biosemiotics. Can't go into that now. Okay, 
the evolution of languages and natural selection. Here's what the idea gets kind of radical. Uh, the plasticity posited by Baldwin and the extended evolutionary synthesis is the key genetic trait that enables the inheritance of linguistic ability. Deacon, again, states this most radically. The guiding, the, he, he claims the guiding principle in the design of languages is, as with living organisms, reproduction and not the effectiveness of communication. That's pretty radical. That language evolves basically uh, so uh, on the basis of reproduction so that it can continue to uh, interact with the human and provide the uh, uh, advantages that that we get from language. And his argument is that uh, the, the selective pressures determining this evolution of language are imposed by their users and above all by children. He makes the argument that children learn language so, so slowly and it requires a language that they can, um, what's the word I'm looking for, that they can, uh, it's accessible to them. And the language then has to evolve in ways and change in ways that is accessible to them. And this is the this is what drives that reproductive uh, uh, impulse of language. Um, okay. And then the co-evolution of language of the human. Uh, so the advances in cognitive systems, this is kind of going over ideas we've had before. I'm look, kind of looking for what I might be able to. Uh, to skip through it. Let's just go down to the final. And here's where this uh, idea of biosymbiotics, of the extended evolutionary synthesis, demise of another, uh, come to this point, a break from Chomsky, remarkable expansion of the brain that took place in human evolution and indirectly produced prefrontal expansion was not the cause of symbolic language. And that's been the view, the traditional can canonical view that the expansion of the brain and of the frontal prefrontal cortex is what enabled language, but rather a consequence of it. We'll say comments on that here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, that's the end of the first two parts. I'm gonna now just two more slides. And these two slides, uh, bring to a conclusion uh, and, and, get pro and provide, based on what I've presented so far, my answer to the question of what is special uh, about language. Language is the prosthetic extension of representational thinking. This coevolution of language with the brain, uh, both phys and the body physiologically and cognitively uh, ended up that language is then a prosthetic extension into the external world of our ability uh, to represent things that are not there, symbolic language. It's a prosthetic, language is a prosthetic extension of that. Uh, kind of believe that I think I've covered those ideas uh, just for the sake of ending up and discussing unless somebody wants to something there. Okay, the second last slide then. So language, there's a deep-seated isomorphic relation between the semiotic system that's at work in human, all living organisms, and this is the biosemiotic perspective mm -hmm. on it. Uh, and the one that informs the evolution of language. In other words, as a prosthetic extension of representational thinking and our ability to use language, we have semiosis, which is biosemiosis in the body, is for the first time projected into the external world. Uh, flexings are approximately you know, correspond to genes, syntactical operations, I kind of I skipped over that, that point, but uh, in the, the evolution of language theory, syntax plays a, uh, a key role among neural linguists and others in describing what is essential to develop the new cognitive, the more advanced cognitive ability is syntax. And syntactical operations are, correspond to the semiotic competence 
front of that is arguably by the same office. And so the first time, a medium, for the first time, a medium, an extension of the human into an organic realm became the locus for semiosis. We have semiosis, we have language that functions semiotically because the human organism, living organism, not just human, living organisms function semiotically. But for the first time now, that semiosis has been extended prosthetically, that is, in language in an external medium. The shift from proto-speech to language, that is representational thinking, abstract thinking, if you will, projects into an external medium the operational aspects of mentality. This is the key right here. It, it projects into an external medium the operational aspects of mentality that are both its cause and its consequence. Makes a little bit to kind of wrap your mind around that. That's, a, that's the very basic idea of co-evolution. Right. It's both the cause and the concept. And the prosthetic extension of mentality itself. So what's being projected uh, uh, into the external world in language is mentality itself. As a medium, language is the prosthetic extension not only of the cognitive system supporting semantic and natural operation, but of mentality itself. And that's a way of stating how closely our mental advanced human mental world is tied in with language. And I'll close with something that's not up here uh, from uh, again, uh, Terence Deacon. Uh, he, he says, he proposes there are two major emergent features in the history of the world. That's one of those big questions, right? <laughs> I've never seen, I've never seen anyone else pose it that way. But he says there are two major emergent features in the history of the world. And he says one is life and the other is mentality. It's kind of another way of putting a stamp on the point I'm trying to make here at the end. All right, that's, that's what I have. And questions. And let me first ask if anybody on Zoom wants to ask a question. Go ahead and speak up. No takers. No takers. They're probably not watching. Yeah, probably not watching. <laughs> I, I, they, I lost them longer. Well, ask an easy one with a tag over here, Sean, and <laughs> Okay, good. Go, go for it. So I'm like kind of an interloper journalist. And in your discussion of the move, from uh, proto science to proto speech to language, um, I heard kind of a, an echo of 18th and 19th century debates about about visual art and uh, and effort. Uh, people not blessing, right? Talking about medium specificity, the appropriateness to certain tasks of visual versus verbal representation. And I, I'm wondering if uh, I, I'm sort of Taking taking you too much of your words seriously when, when you say that um, that the stuff from proto science, which are manual and digestive, right, like pointing at the present object, to proto speech and then to language is this movement away from the visual to verbal um, as a, a kind of discarding of the visual for a way. So that's my misunderstanding. No, not 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 by any means a, a discarding, a, a fusion, if you will, right. But it, it, it's not, and I mean, the other thing that you could write a whole article on, which I have, I mean, it, it, in response to the film, The Cave of Forgotten Dreams by Herzog, that, that goes into the, what's the name of that cave? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, yeah, Let's Go Cave, okay. and looks, looks at uh, cave painting, is, you know, the, the external, uh, uh, the prosthetic extension of the mental world, the uh, images, and how that, and you know, you can go and how that plays into language, but it's a whole, you know, new field. But certainly, no, not leaving uh, the visual behind. That Aaron Batterly uh, scheme, it might be, are, are, are you familiar with the working memory? Anyway, yeah, I figured you had to be. Yeah, the, the, the working memory scheme, one, one is the, fun, there are two loops. It's just about working memory, the things we keep bouncing at one time in our brain. The, the two loops that feed in there, one is the phonological loop, and the other is called the visual spatial loop or sketch pad that 
both of those feed in. So that maybe is one way. Of it. Yeah. it would be helpful. And no, go ahead. Uh, and, uh, yeah, get Ted next. It would be helpful to provide examples of the co-evolutionary process because I mean, right? I mean, just otherwise it seems to be just a pure theory. And the, the kinds of things I'm not an anthropologist; these guys are something. Um, but one of the prime examples I understand successful explanation talking about co-evolutionary theories is something like you know the lactose lactase gene that seems to co-evolve with the habits of farmers dairy and farmers and others that's nowhere near the complexity we want in co-evolution are there examples that would make us right i mean in philosophy of science we think of we need some you know vera causa here we need a a mechanism that is independent of the argument that you're presenting the theory you're presented. It's, it just sounds so speculative until you find anything that remotely looks like a mechanism that could happen. Help? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm not quite sure how I could respond to that. I mean, uh, at some level, it has to be right. You have a critter that didn't speak, and have us speak. There's a change in the linguistic also a change in the underlying genetics, whether you want a strong kind of change, which I don't think comes in the cell or ever did, I don't know. No, no. But something changed in our in, in analogous to the, the single gene changes that case. A whole set of genetic changes that happen between our um, children's and ancestors and us. So there was a co-evolutionary process, whether that that has to be true, I'm not sure. Is it the story is too abstract? Or, they, or, or what's the but, it's something about something, something changed. Yes. Our, our genes changed, changed and our linguistic environment changed. That, so, but, yeah. Let me, uh, but that doesn't tell you anything about the process of change. Yeah. Uh, it must have been changed. This is not going to answer your question directly, but uh, one way to think about this is you know, I, I kind of cut out a certain uh, uh, path of evolution that I focused on. Of course, it leaves out. It leaves out social evolution, right? Uh, and people such as as Nick and others, uh, you know, certainly work with that. And uh, that's a, as important. So it's not like this is the whole story. Yeah. I guess that's that, that would be one way. To, I, I do bring in social evolution very quickly in the article, with, in in one way, because social evolution, uh, and for example. When society starts to evolve, you have roles. The maternal, the female is maternal. The, the hunter, you know, in particular, the male is the hunter. So it's as in very early hominid society, as these social roles begin to develop, that in itself too is a digital code. And I threw this in there in case this question came up. Uh, Umberto, echo once society exists. Every function is automatically transformed into a sign of that function. In other words, you have to have a quote, digital code of social roles in order for society to work. We all have to have an abstract idea of what the male is hunter, that role is, right? Uh, and it has to be one that, an idea we have in the abstract. You can have one, oh, my man is going hunting, but for that, society develop, you have to have that set of roles that somebody can fit into or not fit into. So anyway, that just draws a parallel. But let me tell you. Hi, sorry. I'll come right back to you. Social, social roles and social evolution. Actually, not that evolution. That's the It seems to me that certainly expert this, but it seems to me that the power of the chunks and chunks in the front has some different intelligent in the system and the evolution that seems to be this moral part. This is a brand where the moment the other, which we certainly need to early, is that there is this in terms of 
actual evidence of representation. So I guess my question is, in any of the stuff that we can do, is there any effort to really Uh, the question uh, from Ted was, uh, uh, two, uh, there seems to be something, first comment was something something marvelous about the uh, uh, elegance with which we can think and the, the sophistication, which I took to be a kind of maybe uh, critique of this kind of process of evolution that are presented. But the second then was question, is there any evidence for like, the way that the evolution from proto-speech to language occurred, uh, referencing 150,000 years ago, which is where, where Chomsky uh, comes in. My response first would be that I don't think there was any fast, sudden change 150,000 years ago. Uh, that evolution is a gradual process and that this leap, and this is what uh, theorist in, in evolution theory uh, and the th uh, evolutional language, there's a long gap from the proto speech to where language becomes symbolic, but it's not an overnight thing. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. What is the evidence of this longer, you know, let's say 700,000 years ago? To, uh... There is, I, I wish I could cite more i mean the the uh neurological evidence of the broca area the hand you know the the combination between or the uh, uh the dual mechanism of vocal and and hands is a good piece of evidence i mean there's there's no silver bullet here we don't have we can't go back in time to when people start started first uttering words and then to when they started making sentences so Yes, it's going to be to a certain extent theoretical or speculative or whatever word. Yeah, uh, but that's the that's best I can do. Yeah. I'm actually sympathetic to this way. Yeah. I would like to believe that this is correct. Yeah. The modern problem is that I didn't see a lot of evidence before it was placed in. Well, uh, let, let me get, we had a Zoom question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Next. Uh, yes, your question. Hi. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, your response to Ted's question just now. I I don't know if if you are making a distinction between uh, the biological development from. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. From fr during the hominid era to the point where Chomsky speculates that there was a sudden genetic mutation of some sort, or are you making a distinction between what is classified as proto language and then to a whatever full-blown language. Uh, so if it's the second one, then how do you, I mean, how do you fill out the, your story would depend on how you fill out the details of the proto-language. I mean, for for Chomsky and Chomskyans, proto-language is the grammar. Mm. And even when so-called full-blown language develops, the grammar remains the same. So it doesn't make much difference. And uh, I think they, they could also agree with the fact that, yeah, a whole lot of other things come in from the development of proto language to a full blown language, but the but the 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 structure is already in place, so it doesn't it, that that's not relevant to their story, and 
they can totally agree. So that was my first part of the que first question. Uh, the second question was, I, I, okay. And the second question was, I think, uh, latching onto, I think what Andre asked of what are the failure conditions of this theory? So if this is a theory of evolution of language that you propose, what kind of evidence in the world would you say would come by this theory? So what is, is there any? Yeah, any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I will. It, it, for the most part, it uh, repeats Ted's question. It, it's searching for evidence. Uh, it, and, it, and she references Chomsky again, and specifically Chomsky's idea of a universal grammar, which is certainly at odds with, with the, pres the, the presentation uh, that I've given, both the evolutionary process, but also the idea of a universal grammar. Uh, and it is um, it's an idea that even ling linguists have now started to distance themselves from more, more and more, uh, pretty, pretty starkly. Uh, Jackendorf and, and Pinker, Stephen Pinker, uh, for example, back in 2005, uh, came out with an article entitled, I think it was a title, What a Special Art Language or something similar, and, uh, and really go after uh, go, go after Chomsky's idea of universal grammar. I don't agree with their basic position uh, in, in full, but they argue, well, there are several universal pieces of grammar, but no universal grammar. I, I, that only partial an, partially answers your question, but that idea of universal grammar is tied to the fact that 150,000 years ago, suddenly there was this uh, uh, new human brain and it was able, and a module, well, it comes, it's kind of backed off there a little bit, but a module in the human that, that can work with this universal grammar. It's just a different, it, it's certainly a position I don't agree with. I'm going to go to Dave first because, yes. Um, I, I just thought um, one point we've talked about yeah. um, So, the, it's, it's understand the argument is the usual uh, basis for this uh, human structure. Well, that proto-speech, proto uh, uh, you mean that proto-speech evolved out of uh, the mimetic gesturing in hand, yeah. So, um, so a couple of things on that. I, I think the integration language and the um, system for So when you say it's mechanical it's reasoning, meaning understanding understanding the motion, and it's understanding how you can move a rock to be part of the opportunity. Although it's obviously hard. Um, I wonder if you would get some. So, Uh, first comment that's actually included in, in the paper uh, where I reference the uh, the technological hypothesis. One of the pieces of evidence that uh, plays in, into this hypothesis is study of uh, the, the way la uh, gestures are used with language today and in language learning. So that, that's a that's a key uh, a key part of developing this idea of mimetic gesturing being you know. The origins of proto speech. So, so that and that kind of goes to some of the. There can be some evidence that we can draw from the present, even if we can't go back to the past. So, 
see if I can make this, this, and this. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, I think we're hung up on language too much. I think we should call it communication because it includes both speech and gesture. And if you look at imaging studies of people who have been born without the capacity to have speech and only exist by signing, mm -hmm. if you look at imaging studies, the actual generated brain is firing rapidly from mm -hmm. okay? Because it's not about speech, it's about communication. So it doesn't matter whether it's on an auditory channel or a visual channel. It works similar. Now, paleo neurology. I think you need to take much, bring that much more into your, your argument. I love the idea about speech as a concept. Technology, yeah. I can throw it out. Speech is a concept. Yeah. Language is a concept. That's a great idea. Um, um, prior to all, I'm sure you're aware of, of Bruner's work mm -hmm. in neurology. So it isn't the prefrontal cortex, it isn't the frontal cortex that expands so rapidly. It's the prior layer. This touches my example of what you're talking about, the ability. To create enhanced working memory to manipulate tools that are much easier, representation of others. So, you know, I think there is some evidence. It is a neurology. Homo erectus showed the development in the focus area. Much more development as we go through the human learning trials and record. But there's definitely something interesting going on. But the, but the prefrontal cortex is essential to uh, being able to uh, bring up. From memory, those uh, representations and to yes. work with them in op cognitively yeah, operational ways. But, yeah. Neurons and neurons and neurons and neurons. Yeah. 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 Other new territories, and it seems like I mean, maybe you heard Tom Wynn, who was just here. No, I missed it. Yeah. So he's talking about a lot of the same things you're talking about. I'm just talking about the development of the last time, and, and, and the tool becomes part of the social environment, which I think is also something that it's not just the tool, yeah. Yeah, no, the social environment absolutely tied into this. Also that it's to the brain. Yeah. It can be yeah. Yeah, and I just response to the uh, uh, sign language that that you made. Uh, it, you don't have the the, the vocal motor you know, people without these uh, vocal motor skills, but the sign language is based on a similar kind or the same basically kind of digital code. It's language in the sense that it's working with. I was a bit surprised about um, if it's, if it's just going to help me understand Chomsky better. But I thought famously he didn't have a theory about how uh, universal grammar comes about. He's not an evolutionist at all. So he, yeah, he's, he's not an evolutionist. Right? In that sense, I don't see an evolutionary argument being orthogonal or even contesting this because it's possible. So, right? I mean, for him, he's giving a functional developmental explanation for language. And how it evolved and how God may have done it, right? And what you're suggesting is, is that there's a coevolutionary theory to, to a process that led to some of the formation of language. But in that sense, at least the blunt way I'm presenting it, there's no there's no real uh, battle there. It doesn't mean that you can be it's both right. It could be the universal grammar comes about from the coevolutionary process. Well, I think I disagree with that because. Uh, according to, to Chomsky, there was a uh, biological and anatom uh, 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 evolution uh, to the point that the brain de developed, and even in his earlier theories, an actual module, which was a language module, and then all of language was possible. That goes totally against everything I was uh, presenting here. So what exactly goes against it? So I mean, well, again, the with the quote says in uh, the capacity for language predated language. Right? Is that fair to say? The, the, the capacity for language yes. arose yes. before the linguistic environment existed. 
that's not his argument. That's not I don't that's argument. I don't understand that way, but I think that's well, right, right. Uh, it's uh, argument for universal grammars on the basis of developmental cognitive stimulus kind of arguments. It has nothing to do with an, an evolutionary story or an origin story whatsoever. But that's the no, point. but it, it uh, it's based on the fact that evolution produced a particular language in the Kamaj, one that uh, gave us universal grammar. And this, that's, I think that's what I'm contesting. I mean, like, if you look at the, the thinker response and yeah. you know, responses by these BBS articles uh, from um, Paul Bloom, they're, what they're arguing against is not Trump's universal grammar. Thinker and those people are not. What they're arguing is that uh, that uh, Chomsky needs an evolutionary story or not. So you see, I think that the arguments for universal grammar are completely orthogonal to this origin story. I could just well, be wrong, so just tell me where. Can I, ask I, 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 I would say Chomsky is proposing that universal grammar came to be without any kind of suffering of co evolution, but he doesn't even offer on that. That's you know, the point. He doesn't. So he thinks he needs just purely developmental. So it's sort of like Tim Bergen's four questions. There's a question about it. Origin, there's a question about its function, it's a question about its development. He doesn't have a story about the origin. But, but I, I, and one thing, uh, uh, Tinker and Jacques Van Jackendorf go, go against, they, they argue directly against his concept of universal grammar, too. So that's, that's, right, a different that's our thought. Well, again, if that argument does not say nothing about this theory of evolution, that's, a, that's on different grounds. So they're arguing that the poverty sinus arguments are insufficient. You might, you might pick up on this. So there's two parts. One is what, how much biological change happened to the work that the linguistic capacities that we have. That's probably, you don't want to go as far as saying the universal grammar, perhaps. I'm not sure, but there's some biological changes that happen. Um, and then there's the yes. process yeah. by which they arose, whether that's a co evolutionary process or some kind of other process. But one thing that Bound up within those, then, is at some point early on in the development, evolution of language, there were biological changes happening between our ancestors. But then on your account, it seems like at some point that stops, right? Language keeps evolving. But, and what's evolving in us is changes during development of our, uh, you, you called it uh, neuroanatomy, but not changes, not genetic changes underlying that ability. So is that well, what, what do you you're yourself? saying? Uh, I think anatomical. You can't or teach more. a chimpanzee to speak. Right. Presumably, you wouldn't take one of our ancestors five million years ago and teach it to speak. So there are differences in our genetic code from them that allow us to learn languages. Well, genetic code or uh, or an evolutionary history. The question I would put is, how long would it take? Uh, or will it take, or would it take for primates uh, such as the apes uh, to be able to develop language as we did? Right, so that, that comes back to this question. Right. So for Chomsky, there is something, I don't think he used the, I don't know if he used the word module, but he would say there is some biological capacity we have that other animals don't. So is the argument that we don't have a biological capacity different than other animals? That it has all happened through a social process. Is that well? I, of course, we've developed well biologically, or and here I, I go back to this: the remarkable expansion of the brain that took place in human evolution and indirectly produced prefrontal expansion was not the cause of symbolic, symbolic language, but the consequence of it. It's that the development sure. of, of even the prefrontal cortex and also the you know, the, the neural uh, process that, that makes give us the linguistic ability. Was that co that co evolutionary sure. process? Well, let me just try one. Okay. So I'm not <laughs> denying that, but I'm getting at so this is about the process of which it arose. Yeah. But even on this reading, as a result of this co evolutionary process, we are genetically different today. And if you took away those genes, yeah. I don't care how they yeah. got here, yeah. Yeah. we right. wouldn't be able to produce them. So there is right. a okay, right, right. But so yeah. it's not about the question it's about the clock, right? right? But there's a new argument to that, which is that the capacity for language sociality created allowed took the pressure off straight genetic pressure on the genetics 
and allow it or generalize very quickly to still be that. Or, or to put that a different way, as, as I did in the present presentation, uh, the genetics have been overtaken by this, this by semiotic competence. It's and, and and together with social evolution and, and so things. But that is what now determines human uh, uh, evolution. It's less the genetic evolution and more the cultural evolution. It's still well, ge ge genetics follows, right? Genetic change, genetic change follows the cultural evolution, right? It doesn't, it doesn't cause it. It follows it. Human to, and, and, you know, the human body, human organism responds to uh, the environment. There are changes that, are, that that occur. These epigenetic changes that occur. These create a different genetic. Uh, uh, a different so genetic functionality, if you will. The process of genetic movement kind of changes. It's now a very different system. So we have to is there a is there a hand up in the back? Sorry, sorry. Your hand up, no. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Are you saying that um, the man made these tools at the farm, wheel, and everything, and because we had to teach other people how to use these tools, and language became necessary because grunts just wouldn't do it anymore, or the man just just wouldn't do it anymore, and so we had to create language like this. Um, and so then we did that, and so um, we are not able to communicate the technology to the next generation now. That technology stops or stays at the same. Or stays at the same. So, so my question is, and I'm diverting it away from all the very advice conversations I know. Um, so in Silicon Valley, they have the skills to teach the babies, you know, about the technology and stuff. But say in rural Missouri, they don't have the language to teach things, and so technology stops. So is it like in different populations, technology advances not depending on the ability of the language? Uh, raises a lot of interesting uh, questions. Uh, to you know, to what extent does evolution within certain social groups carry over to you know other social groups? Uh, to what extent does it create a human collective where the you know, where the species as a whole had, you know is evolving? Uh, so that, that's a very complex. It's a very complex question. I don't. In short, I would say yes. I think there's a lot of work in economics right now in terms of that kind of question. Where questions like why do cities have some rather than just density and fractions? Mm -hmm. that, that is the driver of urbanism and technology. And there's also a lot of anthropology and built mathematical models and I don't know if it's the same kind of thing. Cultural exchange. Yeah, if cultural groups are too small, you will actually get something like entropy where they can't see the knowledge above some threshold of intensity interaction. Where you can just maintain the technology, and the more complex that technology is, the more dense density you need. So there's a fragility to it. So then, given your like, you know, how it doesn't need to genetically pass now. Grow up with digital media and just get it, and also then arguably some of us reach a point where we're too old to teach new things, or well, our students might be at a disadvantage. Well, this is also a question of neuroplasticity, right? But it, which is there's been a changing views on that. You know, are we're neural neurally plastic most in, as infants really, in, and as we age. Uh, we lose that plasticity. Now, for 
more recently, there's there's arguments that we're more plastic as we get older than men have been argued previously. But uh, so it's up to the new generation to adapt better and to evolve. Or produce. Yeah, throw something in there, appreciate Jean Pierre Changeux, I think, the French English scientist, argued in 2009. So you did notice that we're basically talking about the market. So we're, we're disregarding genetic. We're, we're almost disregarding genetic. We're saying it, it just happens as a cognitive underdevelopmental under of an individual. You know, Changeux's argument was that there's, there is an evolutionary. Heritage. And that is an increased plasticity. In other words, that we are selecting yep. evolutionarily for brains that happen to be more plastic than others. And if yours is more plastic than mine, you will fry. And I will. Simeon, so that's an argument that I've come across. I used it, but I'm just not sure I want to see how this group would react to it. But that you get the advantage is that you get the evolution, biological evolution back in. And you don't have to keep it at arm's length, which is what Roger and, and our folks generally do. I have to say that that corresponds to this concept of symbiotic freedom, symbiotic competence, right? Uh, the plasticity, our ability, uh, and that's that's natural selection works in there. Those who are able to have a plasticity, whether it's learning digital media or whatever, they have the plasticity okay. to that. There you could actually gather evidence, and I don't buy it, because I don't okay. think there's differential fertility based on plasticity. I think if you measure neural plasticity in people somehow, you don't measure how many babies they were having. Well, right. I don't if think you it want to demonstrate that there's selection on this thing. You have well, to demonstrate that. I doubt you're going to see it. I, I, I'm not sure you would have to bring it down to fertility. Right. If, to make, if you want to, to posit it, that there's natural selection. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Does not work. It does not. It's through the line. And the main reason it's through the line is because this So we're going to get, I think, in three weeks' time, an alternative view there. Um, let me let Roger give the last word, and then we should probably end. And well, we can continue this at lunch. Sure. We have lunch time on. So we'll, we'll, I, uh, I, I don't have any more. I think I put it all, put it all out there. But I, I just say uh, thank you for you know, your attention and, and the questions. I really enjoyed the, the discussion. Appreciate it.